But the Lord has spoken about joy in the word of God. And I believe that it's something that we have to grasp in our lives because we hear a lot of things in the world today. We hear a lot of things in the news. And one thing we don't hear so much is the word joy. We hear sadness. We hear economics. We hear depressions. We hear war. We hear all of these crazy things. But joy is something that we don't hear so much. And I believe that what you hear eventually becomes a product of what you are. What you hear eventually becomes a product of who you are. If you hear certain words over and over, you'll begin to believe them. And I want to come today and let you know that joy is still a real word and you can have joy in your life. Y'all don't believe me, do you? You can have joy in your life. And not just on Saturdays when you're off work, before the kids wake up. You can have joy on Monday, before the coffee. I got quiet. You can have joy on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and the Friday that's not pay Friday. That, that Friday, on the long months. You can have joy. And I believe the word of God tells us how we can do that. And I hope that you'll let me speak for a little bit. I have a little bit of time. We sang, we danced, but the word of God um, has to go forth. So um, if you could real quick turn to John chapter 15, verse 11. John chapter 15, verse 11. John chapter 15, verse 11, and the word of God is God himself. And since he's in the room, can you stand up and just give some recognition to this amazing word that's about to be read? Chapter 15, verse 1 through 11. And it reads, I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, my father, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Someone say much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, Lord, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Verse 9, as the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things, someone say these things, I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. A picture of joy. Pray with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, use this word. It's already good. Let it fall on some fertile hearts that are ready to receive the word of God, that are ready for change in their life, that are ready for deliverance in their life, that are ready for chains to fall in their life, that are ready to leave this place a different person. Let us understand what this joy thing is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. MGC, CJ, you mind putting up that first, that first picture? That's a winning team right there. is a winning team. See some trophies up there? We like that. Pictures are amazing, aren't they? 
pictures are amazing. It, 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 it's funny that pictures have changed over the years. Um, I saw something the other day where, where someone asked, tried to ask everyone in the room, let's do it real quick. Everyone in the room, just make the action of taking a picture. Just do it. Okay, some of you went like this. Some of you guys went like this. It shows how cameras have developed over the years. But pictures are amazing. Our, our phones are full of pictures. Some of us have to clear our pictures every other, of, other week because they get so full of, of pictures. And pictures speak a thousand words, they say. It speaks a thousand words. And, and this picture, it, you don't, from this picture, you don't know much, but from this picture, you see that there are some trophies. There's no tears, so that's good. And there's a whole bunch of smiles. So from this picture, you can assume that it was what? A good day, a good day. CJ, can you go to the next picture? So this, you don't have to clap, don't do that. She'll get all excited. This is my daughter, Parker, and this year was her first year dancing. It was her first year dancing, yeah, yeah. Her first year dancing, and I, 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 I'm actually, I've been around for a while. I'm the OG MG supporter, so I need a shirt, OG MG supporter. Um, I've been here doing the, the competitions. I was the, the, the person carrying everything in there, so you guys are doing a good job now, but I'm the one that started it. But what I realized is that this year was a very different year because I had some skin in the game. My daughter was dancing. Everything was a lot different. Everything was a lot different. And um, the, what I realized is that the day had a whole bunch of ups and downs. It had way more ups and downs than I thought there would be. Um, it, the, the, there was a lot of joy. There, there's joy in this picture. There's, you see happiness. But, but this was not the all-encompassing feeling and emotion of the whole day. There were some tears. There were some fits. There was some happiness and sadness. There was a lot that happened in this day, and this picture does not encompass everything that really happened. You can, you can take it down before she sees it and then she gets happy. Every one of us have a picture of what happiness and joy looks like. Each and every one of us, if I say joy, you're going to think of something that brings you joy. You're going to think of a picture that brings joy to your heart. You're going to think of something that reminds you of joy. And so sometimes we can recall joy. We can think of joy, but we get into valleys in our life where joy is completely absent. And there's scripture after scripture about how joy would be very present in our lives and, and joy would be something that God would give us to get through the hard times and how some people had joy in the midst of diverse temptation and trials. But you're living your life like I just woke up and I am completely upset and there's no joy in my life. And I believe that our picture of joy is just a little off. Our picture of joy is just a little bit off, and I'd like to talk to you all about the picture of joy. The picture of joy. And if you know anything about joy, the, the, the best place for you to look and read about joy is this book called Philippians. Write it down. Philippians. Two Ps. One L. Philippians. And this book is in the New Testament. It's fairly short. It's four chapters. It's not that hard of a read. You can start it. And it's full of joy. And it's not so much full of joy because of the content as much as it's full of joy because of the context. Paul is the writer. It's the epistle of joy. Paul is the writer of this book called Philippians, and he's writing and encouraging the church of Philippi to, to have joy, to have joy, to, to, to live with joy, that God has given us joy, that even in your hard times you should have joy, and he's writing it from the pen. He's in prison. He's writing this from a jail cell. He's writing this chained up literally for what he believes. And if there's no other example of how to have joy, it's someone that's in the middle of affliction still having an aspect or perspective of joy. And so Philippians is a great place 
to start when it comes to joy. There's scriptures like rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. In fact, the, the very book begins with Paul saying, always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. Every prayer he was making while in jail was full of joy. Are you joyful every day? Are you joyful all day? Are you joyful every minute, every hour of the day like our brother Paul? We have to understand that there are some things that come when you speak joy that we have to kind of grasp in order for us to live our lives full of joy. The first thing is knowing the distinction of joy. I want to explain what joy is not. Joy is not happiness. Joy is not happiness. You may wake up and you're jumping all over, you're happy. That's not joy. That's not the joy of the Lord. That's not the joy that the Bible talks about. Happiness is something different. Happiness is an emotional response to something. Happiness is an emotional response to a a current circumstance. And and if you live life, you know that your day can be full of happiness and then sadness. If you have a child, you'll realize that you will be happy one moment and you'll be frustrated the next. You might be sad the next, maybe you'll be happy again, but happy depends on your current surroundings. Happiness is not something that goes deep inside of us. Happiness is not very deep at all. It's on what you see, what you feel, what you hear. Music can make you feel happy, but you'll be done being happy as soon as the song's over. Food can make you happy, but then when you realize how much you ate, you might not be as happy. Happy does not go all that deep. Happiness is elusive. Happiness can be something that you're grabbing for, but you can't reach it. Happiness is something that you'll hold one day and then eventually it slips through your fingers. Happiness is not something that you can bottle up and hold and keep forever. Happiness is not something that stays. It's it's an emotion that's connected to a current outcome. Happiness is not joy. But what is joy? In order to understand joy, joy, real joy, you can't find it in Webster's Dictionary. It's going to give you a very similar definition of what happiness is. To understand what joy is, you have to go to the New Testament. You have to go to the Word of God. In in the New Testament, there's a word for joy, and if you don't know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. So can I teach you all some Greek in the room? Now you got to say it, okay? The word is kara. There you say it like you're from Greece. Kara. I don't know what the people from Greece sound like. (laughs) Kara. (laughs) And kara is a Greek noun which describes a feeling of inner gladness, delight, or rejoicing that is based on spiritual realities independent of what is happening in your life. Joy is an inner gladness, a deep-seated pleasure. It is a depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart, and the cheerful heart leads to cheerful behavior. Joy is not an experience that comes from favorable circumstances, but it's God's gift to believers. Happiness is not joy. Joy is not happiness. They're very closely related, but they're not the same thing. Joy is the heart. Happiness is the face. Joy is the soul. Happiness is of the moment. Joy transcends. Happiness reacts. Joy embraces peace and contentment waiting to be discovered. Joy runs deep and overflows while happiness hugs hello. Joy is a practice and a behavior. It's deliberate and intentional. Happiness comes and goes blithely along its way. Joy is profound and scriptural. Don't worry, rejoice is what it says. Happiness is just like the little bass fish that you have on your wall that says, don't worry, be happy. It's just for a little bit of time. Joy is an inner state of being. Happiness is an outward expression. Joy endures hardship and trials and connects with meaning and purpose. Happy fleets. I want to explain to you that we cannot interchange the two. When we interchange the two, it does something in our minds. When we interchange the two and put happiness in the place of joy, 
we begin to look at God like he has failed us. When we come to church every weekend and we hear people say that the Lord will give you joy, that joy will be this thing everlasting in your life when you get close to God and you go home and you see all the bills on the table and then you're immediately sad. Or in the middle of church when you get that text message and it just, your stomach sinks and you immediately start feeling sad. How can I start feeling sad when I'm supposed to be feeling joyful in the middle of church? Lord, what is going on? And we ask these questions when we interchange happiness and joy. And so we have to understand before we go forward that joy and happiness are not the same thing. And so now you know that joy is this, this, this seated grace in something that is everlasting. We can go on to the next point and understand the enemies of joy. There's enemies to joy. Someone once said that joy is gratitude rooted in the grace of God, no matter the circumstance. It's this gratitude rooted in the grace of God, no matter the circumstance, that says no matter how sad I am, I can still have joy. Yes, you can have joy and still be sad. You can have joy and be happy. Joy can work side by side to whatever emotion you are currently having. Let me, let me explain. So, but when it comes to joy, we all are called to have joy, but understand that there is an enemy to joy. There is an enemy to joy. And there, actually there are quite a few, but the, the one that a lot of us, um, we, we blame it on is the devil. And the devil is here to kill, steal, and destroy. And he, he is like a predator going around seeking who he may devour. He is trying to steal our joy he doesn't want you to have joy. He doesn't want you to have joy. He doesn't want you to even understand what joy is. But one thing the devil really doesn't care about is your happiness. The devil doesn't care how happy you are. The devil doesn't care how happy you get. Because happiness is just as fleeting as the wind. If the, the devil understands us, the devil understands how all this stuff works, because you can be happy and still be in sin. Sometimes the devil uses happiness to kind of, aren't you happy? Doesn't it feel good? Aren't you happy right now? But what the devil tries to do is he tries to make sure that you think that joy is happiness. Because if you think that joy is happiness, you'll get, you cling on to happiness and eventually it'll go away and you're left with nothing. But understand this, that joy comes from the word of the Lord. And the reason why he doesn't want you to understand joy is because he wants to separate you from the very word of God. And if he can separate you from the presence of the Lord, then he has you. He doesn't care if you're sad. He doesn't care if you're happy. He cares if you have joy. And, and so it, the devil is an enemy. He is kind of an enemy of joy. But I want to explain to you who the real enemy is, the, the, the most wanted person. And it's very close to us. The enemy of joy is ourselves. Someone say guilty. There you go. The Bible talks in Galatians, it ties with our main verse very well. The main verse talks about Jesus being the vine and, and we being the branches. Galatians is a place that talks about the fruit that's referred to in John. Some of us have learned the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. But Galatians also talks about the fruit of the flesh. Okay? It talks about the fruit of the flesh and, and everything gives fruit. Some of us give some really present fruit. Some of us don't give so, many, so much pleasant fruit. And, and there's fruit of the flesh that we give off, and there's fruit of the Spirit that we get when we are connected to Him by the Spirit. And I, I, I want to just explain to you how we become the biggest enemy of our joy. It, it's through the fruit that comes off of our fleshliness, off of the flesh that we, our human nature, our human nature. Can I read some of them? Can I read some of them? All right, you guys said okay. So don't get upset because I read these. 
I'm going to read the whole thing. So it says, so I say, let this Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desire desires of your sinful nature, the results are these human fruits. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Yeah, it said wild parties. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then it goes to the part that we all know, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's some words in those fruit that I want to bring up It's jealousy, selfish ambition, and envy. Three words that deal very closely with self. Three words that deal very much with ourselves. And if the definition of joy is gratitude rooted in the grace of God, no matter what the circumstance, I want to explain to you that the biggest enemy to gratitude is thinking of yourself. It's jealousy, it's envy, and it's pride. And I believe it's something that we have dealt with for years, and it's only gotten worse and worse. Back in the day, they would say that the grass looks greener on the other side. It's usually because a neighbor would be looking at their neighbor's grass and be like, man, his grass looks way nicer than mine. That's how it started. It started with someone saying, man, his wife is bad. Ah, man, if I could only. It started with someone saying, man, I wish I could have that. And it developed over time until it has kind of seeped its way into our social media I am not harping social media, but I am kind of talking about the culture that has developed around it. Social media has become this thing where we are constantly looking at what other people are showing that are highlights in their lives. A lot of times we're looking at the highlights of people's lives. Uh, Kristen, can you you do the next picture? This is an amazing picture. This is an amazing picture, but Like some of you out there, you probably have like eight or nine other photos before the one that you post in your phone. Don't lie to me. There's like, this is like the the fifth one. There's four above it and there's three after. And then when you get home, you got to pick the one that works. It's who we are. And this does not describe the morning that these two had. As a coach and as a, as a coach, as a mom. And what we do is we we highlight the best of us. And then we start looking at this picture and saying, man, you know what? Ah, man, I I, I wish I could dance. Or or let's just say, I wish I had a bowl like that. Or, you know, I wish I had a jacket like that. Or I wish I had that. Or I wish I saw what they were, I wish I had what they were posting on social media. Or I wish I had what, you can take the picture down. I wish I had this or I wish I had that. And all we're doing is scrolling through our phones, kind of saying, man, what if I could do this? Or what if I could have this? Or what if I did look like this? Or, Or what if my friends were like this? Or what if my next vacation looked like me on the beach like this? Or what if this or what if that? And something happens with inside of us and envy begins to increase and covetousness begins to increase and we begin to wish that our life looked like something else and it has become the norm I'm guilty it has become the norm and what it does is it begins to take away our joy because we are not grateful for what the Lord has done in our lives, what he has specifically given to you and to yours. We begin to start looking at everything around us and forget what we have at home. How many times do we take for granted the things that God has put in our lives? 
How many times do we take for granted the job that he did give us? How many times do we take for granted the person that he has put into our lives? How many times have we taken for granted the talent that he has given that you just haven't worked out yet? How many times have we taken it for granted and not been grateful for what God has put into your life? And so the biggest enemy of joy becomes ourselves. It becomes ourselves. I believe that our usage and our utilization of our eyes has become the biggest driver to mental depression in our history. The things that we see but cannot have has affected our joy and our aspect of joy. We are consistently ingesting and digesting things with our eyes that may be reality or it may be the eighth picture in the camera roll out of 50. In order to understand this and to get over this cultural shock, to get over this thing, this pandemic of health that we are seeing, we're going to have to understand joy a little more. We're going to have to start being grateful for what is in front of us. We're going to have to start being grateful for what God is doing in our lives, no matter the circumstance. No matter the circumstance. The last point I have is is the focusing of joy. The focusing of joy. And, and, and it's easy to say, you know, have more joy. Take the offering. See you next week. It's not so easy to just choose joy. Let's be honest. If we could just leave here today and choose joy, we would. But it's not that easy sometimes. It's not as easy as putting on a new coat that says joy and walking out with a smile. It takes a little bit more because understanding that joy is rooted in something, it should be rooted in something that's everlasting, that, that is no matter the circumstances still there and very present, it's hard to do it. It's hard to find that thing. And I do want to disclaimer that choosing joy is not the issue. It's knowing where to focus your joy. It's knowing where to focus your joy. A lot of us have been let down because we have focused our joy on things that have failed us. We have gotten out of a very emotional season, if you are a Bengals fan. We have put our joy in the orange and black for years and years and years. And we have been let down quite a bit. This year, we were on the way. And we kind of put our joy into them a little more. And they won that second game, and we put a little more joy. We were happy. And then they won that third game, and we were buying shirts, remember? (laughs) We were happy. Then they made it to the Super Bowl, and we were were like, forget COVID. Let's Let's get these dips. Let's get these beanies and weenies. Get the nachos together. Our joy, we were so happy, some of us, some Detroit fans in the room, we, we, were, we were so happy. The joy was there. We were excited. And then Monday after the Super Bowl came, we, were, we took the shirt off. We threw the shirt in the laundry. But I had to realize I'm, in our lives, we have to, to choose where we direct our joy. That we can't just be slinging our joy to every and every and anything. That's not what joy is for. I, I, I cannot let my joy be, reside in a group of men playing a game every Sunday. That's not where I have to lie. I cannot let my joy reside in a celebrity that I do not even know. I cannot let my joy reside in a job that I could be fired from next week. I can't let my joy reside in the friends that could be fickle around me. I cannot let my joy be focused on things that are not strong and structured. How many of us have been let down because we have put our joy in things that failed? We put our joy in men that we thought were the one and it just didn't work. We put our joy in that girl that we thought was the one. It just didn't work. But we have to learn to prioritize 
where we put our joy, where we focus our joy, because where we put our joy is going to be how we go through the situation. Where we put our joy is going to be the thing that carries us over the gaps. Where we put our joy is going to be the thing that help us through our valleys. I want to read Romans 12, 1 and 2. We talked about Romans 1 on Friday. If you missed it, you missed it an amazing release night. An amazing release night. And we talked about how it said, the Bible says, lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. But the very next verse says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and I. Can I tell you how unpleasant it probably was? We have read it. It sounds horrible, but we can never experience the pain that he went through. But the scripture is saying, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. How can you even bring up the word joy in the, crucif the crucifixion? It's not like Jesus had powers and the nails felt good. It wasn't a joyful experience to him. So, so why use that word? It's because his focus was past the cross. Where he was looking was past the nails. Where he was looking was past the piercing of his side. Where he was looking at was at you on the other side of the cross. And that's where he put his joy. He put his joy in knowing that the sacrifice that he was making was going to be for you in your worst time. The sacrifice he was making was going to be to make sure you had a future that was prospered. Not a future that just looks good here on earth, but a future that went past sin. How many of us are putting our joy in things that are focused and look past the pain that we are currently focusing on. The Lord had to look past what was going on and even in his worst moment said that there could be joy. There can still be joy in the middle of your breakup. There can be joy in the middle of all these issues that you're going through. There can be joy in the middle of the medical procedure that you have to get. There can be joy in the middle of the diagnosis that you just had. There can be joy in that issue that you have at work. There can be joy in all of those things. Why? Because God has given us an expected end. God has given each and every believer a hope for the future a hope for the future, and that is where our joy resides. Can you show the last picture? Last picture. Uh, you know, when, this is probably my favorite picture of the whole, um, the whole weekend. My mom got to come and see Parker, and I took a picture of them walking, and she got her a purple balloon, and they were holding hands and walking away. And it's, it's one of my favorites, but what I had to do was I had to crop a few things out. I had to crop a few things out. There's two or three people smoking over here, and there was a kid running around with his shoes off over here to the right. And generally, the, the other thing I had to do was this picture was very dark. There was no color to it. It was, it was just kind of gray, I, I guess because it was a cloudy day. It was really gray. But what I had to do is I had to put a filter on it. And when I put the filter on it, it began to look a little brighter. It began to look a little better. And, and I, I want you to understand the joy of the Lord is like a filter on your life. The picture of what you're seeing might not look good, but as long as I have a filter called joy of the Lord, the picture is going to look a little different. The picture might not come out how you thought it would come out, but just go ahead and put a little filter on it. For those of you that don't understand what a filter is, they would say that you put on rose-colored glasses, but it's okay to put on rose-colored glasses when your faith is secure in the Lord because everything you see is going to happen regardless but the way that you look at it can change from day to day. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what kind of issues you're currently facing. But if you put the filter of joy of the Lord over top of it, your perspective is going to change. How you feel about what you're going through is going to change. That's how in the middle of your issues, you can praise the Lord. That's how in the middle of your depression, you can still wake up and count it all joy. 
Oh, come on, can, can I just rile you guys up a little bit? Because Paul is riding in a jail cell. Come on, y'all, let's get this going. For Paul's riding in a jail cell. He's, he's, he has to be afflicted. He has to be sad. He has to be hurting. The chains have to be weighing him down. I'm sure the food wasn't very good. I'm sure it wasn't a very good time, but he's still writing about joy. And there's some things that he wrote in there that just don't, that don't make sense because he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And uh, I will say it again, rejoice. In all things, rejoice. So that means in all things, rejoice. And I wonder if there's anyone in this place today that can rejoice no matter what you're going back to when you leave this place. I wonder if there's someone else that can rejoice in this place no matter what mail came in. I wonder if there's anyone in this place that can stand up on their feet and give God some praise to say that I know I'm currently going through some things, but the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's not the happiness of the Lord. It's not the happiness of the Lord. It's the joy I receive from being connected to the vine. And I wanna to explain to you that the fruit of the spirit is not something that you can just go to jungle gyms. They have everything, but they don't have the fruit of the spirit. You have to be connected to the vine in order to get, ah, you have to be connected to the vine in order to experience the fruit of the spirit. You have to be connected to the vine in order to reap the fruit of the spirit. Some of us have never had an encounter with God. So what that's saying is that you don't really get joy without God. If you don't know Jesus, you don't get joy. You will be happy. You'll probably get really excited about some things. But tomorrow... It's this joy thing. And, and, and so... I, I, I wonder if someone can just kind of just get bold about the joy that they have in the Lord and, and, and be like Paul and in the middle of your affliction, let out a cry to the Lord that says, I'm confident of what I'm going through and I'm still going to keep on pushing because I know when I look past my problems, I see you. When I look past my situations, I still see you. Can you be like the writer that says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted and not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. I believe that when you begin to use joy correctly, how you look at life will begin to change. Where you focus your joy will determine what your picture looks like. Some of us have been trying to get the family together for the perfect photo. And you know how that works. Someone's always going to blink. Someone's hair is always going to be off. There's going to be that cousin that wants to see the photo before everyone moves. And it represents these issues, these situations, these circumstances that are going to change. The picture might not look good. Someone might be blinking. A kid might be a blur running through the picture. But when we put this filter of joy that says, yeah, the picture looks like that, but when I change my perspective of what's happening in life and I begin to remind myself that I serve a God that has provided everything that I have ever needed. And I begin to, to think that, yeah, I'm going through it, but God. Yeah, I'm, I'm hurting in my body, but God. Yeah, I, I don't understand this at all. But I know God, I know his word is true. And that's all I have to rely on. And I believe that there's some people in this room that have been chasing happy, that have been trying to just grasp it happy, and, and once you got it, it just kind of falls through your fingers. You, you've kind of experienced happy for a little bit, and then it's gone. You try to bottle it, but you wake up the next day and realize it didn't stay. And Today, I want to open the altar 
for those of you that want to shift your focus of where you put your joy from that guy and shift it to Jesus. Shift your joy from the money that you think you can make. Shift your joy from whatever money you're getting from your tax return because it never ends up being exactly what you thought it was going to be. And shift your eyes on the joy of the Lord. And I believe that when we shift our joy to something that is, has a strong foundation, we won't be feeble and waver in the wind when things happen. That's how we become steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because we have clung to something. We have placed our joy into something that is much stronger and much higher than I. You may be sad today. There's room for joy. You may be very happy today. Joy and happiness can coincide. You might not understand your emotions, but one day you'll figure it out. First, make sure you get some joy. If you have been trying to figure this thing out for a while, come down to the altar. Come down to the altar. Don't leave this season in a saddened state with no joy. Because we have seen it, what happens when sadness just continues and continues and continues and continues and you have a little bit of happiness and it kind of fleets and it's sadness and it's let down and it's over and over. And we've seen people get to the end of their rope and make the decision that this is just way too much for me to handle. And it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how experienced you are at life, we all need some joy.